wow. Hey, it's crazy because uh, one of my friends said that um, if you have, ever get scared of public speaking, picture everyone naked. But for a recovering sex addict, it's probably good that I can't see <laughs> all of you out there. <laughs> um, I'm blessed to be here today in front of you and um, just watching Destiny and, and, and Liza give their, um, their testimony about me being their, um, their loved one. It was kind of, um, a little bit was hurtful, but it's the truth. And um, the truth about that is, I mean, I just want them to know that I'm extremely sorry um, for all the pain I caused them. And it's the reason why I'm here giving my testimony tonight in front of you guys. Even sorry to my, um, my fiance, who's um, one of the reasons why I'm up here in front of you guys as well. Uh, my journey has been a long journey. I can remember since I was about six years old, where um, I think that where I ever first felt the um, the power of addiction. Um, my father was a drug addict, and I don't know if any of you know anything about being an addict, but an addict can pass down that addiction through genes. And I think he maybe passed that gene down to me, which I would never blame him for because I knew what I was doing the first time I tried cocaine. And, you know, it took me down a really dark place. But I'm a survivor. And I'm here just to tell you my survival. I can remember all the way till I was about six years old. I can uh, remember my, um, my mother and my father arguing. I can remember their dishes being broke and my mother um, taking it till she couldn't take it no more. She had a nickname for me, it was Mooka. And I remember her saying, Mooka, let's go to the store. And we wound up going to the store. She asked my father, Joe, what do you want? And he said a beer. And um, my mother was a really strong woman. And uh, if I'm not mistaken, I think that's the last time that he ever seen my mother. This was in 1986. She didn't die till 1992. But even on her deathbed, he wanted to see her and she would be like, no, no. Mm. That was really traumatic for me. My life has been really traumatic, full of ups and downs. But like I said before, I'm here. I remember being 10 years old, well, me and my mother talking about that big house that I was gonna buy her. But I never got, her, got to get her that big house. I remember in January, 1992, going on a skiing trip with my family. Um, my mother complaining about her stomach was hurting. And um, found out later that it was colon cancer. And by July of 1992, the colon cancer had, you know, beat her down and broke her up. And I could remember the, the last day I seen her, she had blood come out of her eyes and her nose, her mouth. I can just remember her saying, Mooka, Mooka, be good. Or well, at least trying to get it out. And um, I remember the, um, 
I remember my grandmother telling me, your mother's gonna die today. And uh, we went home from the hospital. Like 10 minutes later, the hospital called. And they told us, told us she was dead. And like you seen on the video, when I found out that she died, I went to the park all day. She died in the afternoon, the sun went down and the sun came back up. And that was the first time that my grandmother gave me the space and the opportunity to stay out all night. It wasn't the last time though that I stayed out all night, but <laughs> that was the first time she gave me the pass. But ever since then, I, I realized that I was just like trying to hide pain. Even though in hiding that pain, uh, I went along to high school and high school played with some great players. And I went to a, a great high school that was really known to be a basketball power in New York City. The kids that went there, we called it Christ the King University because of its collegiate atmosphere, its love for sports, and you know, everybody wearing Letterman jackets and so on. Where I wound up becoming the number one player in the country. Um, me and another great player, his name is Tracy McGrady, we were like 1A and 1B, according to um, who you asked. Um, but um, Tracy McGrady was um, able to take his talents and make it to the Hall of Fame. And it's just too bad that I was distracted by my disease. And that's what addiction is, is, is a disease where your mind can't really make rational decisions. You know. But like I said, I'm a fighter. So when I when my senior year of high school, I chose to go to um, the University of California, Los Angeles, which is UCLA. And the coach there, he gets fired on my birthday. So from there, I chose to go to the University of Nevada, Las Vegas. For its good and bad reasons. I guess I like the fast life. But then I was told to leave the University of Nevada, Las Vegas, because they said I cheated on my SAT. Now, I don't know how a 6'9 black kid cheats on the SAT. But after they caught me cheating on my SAT, <laughs> I decided to go to the school where the coach from UCLA was going, which was the University of Rhode Island. Um, where I decided to play basketball and um, just picked up a lot of bad habits. Whether it was smoking marijuana or just abusing as many women as I can abuse, which I'm greatly sorry for. And I think I'm here today to um, ask for forgiveness from, from my kids and um, their mother even my fiance. So I'll give you a quick little story. So at the University of Rhode Island, I don't know if any of you know about the NCAA tournament. Um, but it's something that the University of Rhode Island like doesn't do a lot. 
They've never won a, a conference championship. And we needed three, win three games in a row to win the conference championship. And we were able to do it. Put the team on my back. The conference championship game, we are playing against the Temple Owls. They were a big, strong team, methodical, really physical. And I get the ball on the, on the wing and five, four, three, two, one, let up. Like I knew it was going in before it went in, one of those shots. And it's probably one of my top athletic moments of my life. And what I can remember is, I guess all the pain from losing my mother, um, from having to leave UNLV and having to sit out my freshman year. It just all was just flushed out. I couldn't even do my interviews. Just crying, crying a, a big mess, which was a little embarrassing because I'm like the man on the team, you know what I'm saying? Um, but I remember sitting, laying on the floor crying. And I remember my man, Antonio Reynolds Dean, like they were trying to pick me up. He's just like, nah, just let him go. Then in 1999, I get drafted to the LA Clippers. I mean, they definitely weren't like the Clippers of now. <laughs> they were bottom feed of the NBA. And I was always used to winning from Christ the King. We were ranked number two in the country. All the way to Rhode Island to me hitting that shot, catapulting my team into the NCAA tournament. Now I'm, you know, bottom feed of the NBA. Which, you know, if you're 19 years old and you, know, you have a lot of money now and you have any bad habits, it's probably not a good atmosphere for you. Because I continue to abuse weed and abuse as many women that came my way. So in my um, second and third year with the Clippers, I was um, got suspended twice for marijuana, which at that time, because of my talent and my upside, probably wound up being a 30 to $40 million joint. Um, because there's no doubt in my mind that I probably was on my way to a max contract. But it really wasn't something that um, any team could take a risk on. But Uncle Pat Riley stepped up, he believed in me. And he, um, he gave me a shot, which I'm grateful for to this day. <laughs> And me, another, another great player that I was able to play with, his name was Dwayne Wade. Yeah. It was his rookie season. And we were able to help the Heat and make it to the playoffs. Um, I was just able to play one year with the Miami Heat. And then I got traded for Shaquille O'Neal. Not a bad player to get traded for. <laughs> uh, I got traded back to the um, LA, but to the LA Lakers. Uh, Uncle Pat put a couple of dollars in my pocket as a signing bonus. And I was in a good place at that time.
And in that time, I came back to Miami to hang out. And I was with a dear friend, hanging out on the sh at the Shore Club, where my life changed forever. Because that's when I was introduced to cocaine. And my first time doing cocaine, it was an incredible rush. It was almost like orgasmic a little bit. Excuse my language. Um, but it just started this continuous cycle in my life where you keep doing it because you're trying to feel like it did the first time, which you never get that feeling again. It really took me down some dark, some dark, dark places. Some dark nights fighting that demon. Whew. Excuse me for pausing because I don't really want to cry. Um. But I just kept trying to numb pain um, of my mother. And when she passed away, my grandmother raised me. And I know no matter what I've been through, I know God is on my side because he gives me signs. As you've seen on the screen, you know that my child died. He was six months years old. But I know I'm in God's favor because he died on the same day as my grandmother. Um, three years apart. So to me, that was like her telling me that I got him. Excuse me. And through all that, I've, I've still had a, a blessed basketball career. Won two NBA championships. I even won an um, a individual award, winning six men of the year. Even while I was shooting a reality show which I don't never think it'd be done again. <laughs> Seriously, that shit was hard, man. And, uh, you know, after the reality show, I'm still, I get married and of course you guys know get divorced. So I got to sign the divorce papers. I don't even think the ink on the divorce papers wasn't dry, wasn't even dry yet. And I give into my addiction, my sex addiction at that time. And I go to that damn brothel But my right hand of God, 
I didn't do drugs that night. I don't know how they got it in my system, through a drink, maybe a needle on my arm. But the drug addict in me wants to know, like, what the fuck did they give you to knock you out for three days? And that was a real trying time for my family. Of course, seeing that on the news, then having to come see me in the hospital. Like you heard my daughter say, they told them to say their final goodbyes. And then she said that prayer, which woke me up. I can't really remember anything from being when I was down. I didn't have a see Jesus moment or anything like that. But I do remember waking up and just pulling the tubes out of my mouth. And still got the scar right here on my neck for pulling the tube out. And I guess that's just the fighter in me. That's just the older in me. But when I woke up from the coma, I couldn't walk or talk. Um, imagine I'm a big, strong athlete. You know, at that time, kind of used to expressing my thoughts. I can't, I can't talk or walk. In the hospital, I couldn't even hold my bowels. I was really humbling. Really humbling. But I know I'm here for a reason. Uh, I mean, the reason uh, is all my kids. I can't see them, but I know they're in here somewhere. And I'm living for them and my fiance, who's one of the strongest women I've ever came across. Yeah. She's my life coach, my workout coach. She's helped me leave the porn alone. Got me stop smoking reefer. Um, but the realest thing she told me is that she can't marry me until I get things right with my children. That's her? Oh. Oh, you over there, Brina? But um, I'm forever grateful for her and for you guys tonight listening to my testimony. I love you all, and that's about it.